Hi there, and a very warm welcome to Season 3, Episode 29 of People Soup. It's Ross McIntosh here. Pea Soupers, thanks for tuning in. This week it's part two of my conversation with Dr. Shane McLaughlin. Yeah, people have been trained to raise general cognitive ability for as long as psychology has been around. And with good reason, given all of the things it predicts and how strongly it predicts some things. There are a lot of things that haven't worked. Working memory training hasn't worked. Video game training hasn't worked. Music training hasn't worked. Chess hasn't worked. Compensatory education hasn't worked, which is quite counterintuitive if you're in the field of education. You think that if people get extra input, then they will perform better. Yes, to some extent, but not enough necessarily to equalize performance because cognitive ability factors in there a lot and it's very sticky, very difficult to change. And Shane went on to talk about his relatively low expectations from his PhD research data. He was prepared for no results, to find nothing. And what he actually found surprised, and I'd even go as far to say delighted him. So in this episode, we really delve into Shane's research on the impact of smart training. First of all, what is it? And secondly, the impact of smart training on general cognitive ability in school kids. Listen on as we speculate upon the potential impact of SMART for the working population, as organisations become increasingly more complex and jobs become more cognitively demanding. And we'll finish with Shane's song selection and a cracking takeaway too. This conversation was such a pleasure. Shane is open, honest, thought-provoking and humble, as well as being great fun. People Soup is a community of people who are interested in behavioural science at work and how we can make it accessible, fun and useful for ourselves and each other. At work, behavioural science has the capacity to enhance our well-being, help us be the person we want to be more often and provide us with perspectives to enable cooperation, collaboration and innovation. It was psychologist Abraham Maslow who said, A first-rate soup is more creative than a second-rate painting. And that was the inspiration for this podcast. More than ever, the world of work is a heady mix of people, behaviour, events and challenges. When the blend is right, it can be first rate. Behavioural science and psychology has a lot to offer in terms of recipes, ingredients, seasonings, spices and utensils. So welcome to People Soup, where we aim to nourish the mind and flourish at work. Let's get down to news and reviews. Firstly, news. I've edited this episode, or the main body of it, with a new bit of software called Descript. I'm still learning about it and it's blowing my mind. Basically what happens is I upload the sound files from my chat with Shane and it produces, in a few minutes, a transcript that's 95% accurate. Blimey, I hear you cry. People Soup has embraced artificial intelligence. But hang on. You can then edit the transcript like you would in a Word document and it correspondingly edits the audio. So if you remove a sentence in the transcript... It'll remove the same sentence from the audio too. Whoa. Boom. I'm still learning, and it's taken me a while to learn, but it's pretty darn cool. You can access the transcript for this episode via the show notes at rossmackintosh.co.uk. Second bit of news. I'm delighted to have been invited to interview some of the speakers and workshop hosts for the ACBS UK and Republic of Ireland conference in November. If you want to find out more about the event... The link is in the show notes, and my first guest is the brilliant Dr. Ray Owen. And thirdly, three bits of news, blimey, a correction. In Shane's first episode, he made a reference to an Aldi and Trim. Peace supers, it has subsequently emerged that there is no Aldi and Trim. I have a statement to read out from Dr. McLaughlin. He says, It's actually a little in Trim I was thinking of, but I wasn't sure about how to pronounce it, so I panicked and said Aldi. Dr. McLaughlin is now taking some time to consider the impact of those comments. We would also like to say jointly that if Aldi were thinking of opening a store in Trim, then we'd be very up for opening the store and cutting the ribbon. Subject to our A-lister fee, of course, or, to be honest, perhaps something marvellous from the central aisle. Anyway, reviews are in for part one with Shane. Thanks to everyone who shared, commented and listened to that episode. I'm so glad you enjoyed it. On Facebook, Dr. Sarah O'Connor Cassidy said... Love this podcast. I didn't know your history, so it was really interesting to hear this. Very much looking forward to hearing the second part of this. I'll keep my eyes out for another good Dr. Ian for you. There's probably at least one more excellent one out there for you. That's a kind of in-joke from episode one with Shane. Sarah goes on to say, Oh, and I think Aldi and Navin is possibly better. 
Sarah finishes by saying, well done on the interview. It was an excellent listen and I'll share it broadly. Looking forward to reading the new paper too when it's officially out. Very, very nice work. Thanks very much for listening, Sarah. Great to get your feedback. If you do enjoy the podcast, I'd love it if you would subscribe, rate and review it. Whatever platform you're on, it helps us amplify our voice and reach more people with stuff that could be useful. For now, get a brew on and have a listen to part two of my conversation with Dr. Shane McLaughlin. Now, Shane, I want to dive in to your research, the smart training and sure. what you explored and what the impact was. Can you take us on a guided tour, maybe starting with what is smart training? Sure. Well, SMART aims to train relational operands. And what I mean by an operand is a pattern of behavior that we perform that is useful. It's a pattern of behavior that is reinforced. It's reinforced in the sense that we do it again and again because it gets us things that we want and need. Maybe some people will disagree with me on that definition, but I, I think that's probably a decent way of explaining it. And I think the whole idea about having patterns of behavior that are generally useful is that they're also generally applicable. In RFT, relational frame theory, we call it arbitrarily applicable. I don't know if it's quite arbitrarily applicable, but it's more that it's contextually applicable. It's applicable depending on the context, and the context is what makes you apply it, basically. And so we're training people to relate arbitrary stimuli, so just nonsense words in the training. And by training this ability to relate things in complex networks in different ways, well, the idea is if people can do that cognitively, then they can do it in their daily lives with the stimuli that they encounter there. And so Mm. the idea is that if you do that, then maybe this is what it means to be intelligent in the sense that humans are intelligent, that we can manipulate symbols and it's adaptive. So what I really like about this is that it's congruent with modern evolution science in the sense that we're talking about adaptive behavior. It also gives an account of how it evolved in the first place, because if you look at the old RFT studies, you can see how there's basic matching behavior that you can reinforce, and then you can reinforce further behaviors till it scales up. And we have things like treating this as symbols that mean same as, symbols that mean different to. It's quite difficult to explain in the abstract, I guess, but it's more so just the fact that the really basic discrimination of stimuli that you can scale up to being these complex patterns of behavior, things like analogy and hierarchy and all of these kind of cognitive skills that cognitive science more broadly thinks is important. Relational skills in particular is important. There's people in cognitive science and neuroscience, people like Graham Halford, Micah Goldwater, then in education, you've got people like Patricia Alexander, and even the, the nemesis of, of behaviorism, Noam Chomsky in, in linguistics, he talks about universal grammar, which is essentially, from an RFT point of view, just relational networks between stimuli. It, it seems like multiple fields have basically converged upon this idea that the ability to relate things effectively is what it means to be intelligent in the sense that we, we mean in in terms of being able to do these kinds of complex cognition that we need for our daily life for things like you know mathematics and computer science and those kinds of things so smart trains those abilities and my phd is seeing well look if we train those abilities will people perform better on iq tests and will they perform better on things that iq tests predicts particularly educational attainment And we've two studies, one which was accepted with minor revisions. We should hear about that soon, hopefully. And one that has just been accepted with major revisions, but they're not that major. And we're hoping that that will be out soon. And we've got some follow-up studies, some review studies and combined studies that we're going to be doing over the next few months. And hopefully we'll be able to make inroads in terms of how to raise this general cognitive ability, which... Maybe a lot of behaviorists don't believe in, but it's hard to do a PhD in it and read all of that literature and not come out believing in it. (laughs) So it's, you know, it's a really good predictor of academic attainment and workplace performance and things like that. Mm. So I think it's really important to whatever it is to raise it because 
hopefully it can help people to deal with increasingly complex environments and as obviously jobs are getting more complex you know if you look at we'll say production lines and whatnot they're being automated those sorts of repetitive simple tasks now we need more computer scientists and things like that than ever engineers and they require complex manipulation of symbols it would be tremendously useful if we could raise general cognitive ability it would just mean that people could perform the same complexity of tasks in in less time or else in the same time perform more complex tasks i think it could be a really useful intervention i mean when you look at what iq predicts it predicts weird things mortality obviously things like cognitive decline are tremendously important it predicts well-being predicts all kinds of things that you wouldn't expect it to until you really look into the literature even if you don't believe that conceptualizing things like that cognitively is the best way to go the bottom line is it predicts things that are important to us and whatever it is if we can raise it then that would be a good thing of the utmost importance in in my opinion because it affects so many things even if it's a construct it's an omnipotent one so yeah i'm quite excited about it because all of our results have been positive so far we've been doing studies in schools with kids so we've had active control conditions so we're gradually increasing the rigor gradually increasing the sample size too ideally we want to get to a place where we have no reasonable doubt that the effects that we're seeing in terms of increases on IQ are an accident or they're poor analysis or, you know, bad design, they're placebos or expectancy effects and this kind of thing. And we're making a lot of inroads there and it's all been positive so far. And that's great because I think IQ is one of the oldest topics in psychology and it's probably the best validated concept in psychology as far as I can tell. And nobody has managed to raise it in such a way that, you know, you can train people to perform better on tests, but whether that actually affects their life beyond that in terms of academic attainment, for example, that's something that people haven't done successfully before in over 100 years. It could be really important. And I think people studiously ignore that, the importance of this construct and this, or whatever you might call it, cognitive ability. But it's a a really important individual difference that, you know, you want to match your life to that as best you can. It's this idea of biting off more than you can chew. You want to be able to be sure that you have the temperament and the ability and obviously the will, the values to cope with your environment. And your ability to cope is numerically more important than what you value. So what, what you value, let's say we call that something like personality. And we want to predict educational performance. That might predict it at something like 0.2, 0.25 for something like conscientiousness, which is our proclivity for hard work. For IQ, it's 0.5 or for complex jobs, it's 0.6. And that's a huge difference because you have to square that. Correlations of 0.25, if you square that, you've got what? A quarter of 0.25 is (laughs) smallish. Okay. Whereas if you square 0.5, It's 25% of the differences between people. We have reason to be optimistic, don't get me wrong, but it's just that important a problem. I'm not saying we've got the answers, but we're certainly making inroads. And other fields seem to agree with us that relational skills are tremendously important for cognitive ability. And RFT has a solution for how to train relational skills, which is, Mm -hmm. um, I think that's something to be really optimistic about. So tell us, if you can, this smart training, this relational skills training, was it delivered online? Is it possible to give us an idea or paint a picture for us of that? Sure. Well, it's it's gamified. It's online. You can create an account. You can log in. It's really good because there are 70 different stages. And if you compare that to other popular kinds of cognitive training, let's say NBAC, which is a working memory training, where you might have five or seven different levels if you're really smart and you can make it that far when you've got seven different levels between let's say people with i'm almost reluctant to say low cognitive ability but you know what i mean people who might struggle with those kinds of tasks and then you've got on the other end let's say stage seven for the people who are geniuses that means that the steps up between these stages are bigger and therefore harder 
whereas if you look at smart training it's over 70 stages so it's much more manageable user friendly and because it's developed by behavior analysts you're constantly getting rewarded you can earn points badges and that really does make a difference i think psychologically in terms of how engaging it is i think it's really engaging even if it's tremendously challenging it's challenging over 70 stages right it's not challenging over two and i think that's one of the things that makes it really accessible and we got some qualitative data that i haven't published or at least not yet but kids love it they don't particularly like iq tests but the training itself they they want to do more of it which i think is something that is probably surprising given the challenge that it, it, it poses over however many stages but at the same time the kids that i studied were in school and the whole idea is that your overall level of let's say cognitive ability I'm using that term loosely, of course, is your ability to manipulate relational networks, which is kind of what we're training. That means that if kids got to roughly stage 15, which they did in in my studies, well, then an adult could certainly benefit over 70 stages. And that's what some of the guys in Maynooth, for example, where they had some of the initial studies that's some of the stuff that I think they're finding. I know they've done studies on kids, so I, I don't want to say that for sure, but I know there's some ongoing work. I'm just not sure of the age range, but I think in adults, it's something that we should be excited about. We don't know yet, for example, whether smart training is going to help prevent things like cognitive decline for people of a certain age. I know that Anani Presti in, in Italy, he's doing some work on this and he's found some positive results. I'm not sure what stage that research is at at the moment, but I did see him present some of it at an early stage at a conference, and it was tremendously positive. As you can see, this could impact people's daily life in a lot of ways if we test it properly and it works. We have to do both. Mm. I I note your caution, but I also note the excitement around this. Yeah, people have been trying to raise general cognitive ability for as long as psychology has been around, and with good reason, given all of the things it predicts and how strongly it predicts some things. There are a lot of things that haven't worked. Working memory training hasn't worked. Video game training hasn't worked. Music training hasn't worked. Chess hasn't worked. Compensatory education hasn't worked, which is quite counterintuitive if you're in the field of education. You think that if people get extra input, then they will perform better. Yes, to some extent, but not enough necessarily to equalize performance because cognitive ability factors in there a lot and it's very sticky, very difficult to change. To be candid, when I got my data in for my PhD, after all of the reading of the dismal literature on this and and all of the failures, I thought, well, look, I'm going to hear what my analyses will be. It will work or it will not. And I will accept what it's going to be. And I was prepared for the uh, results to be null results for us to find nothing. And then in two studies that were bigger than any of the smart studies that have been done to date, with also lower training completion, we found the results that we would have predicted. I was prepared for null results, but we found them in spite of all of the things and all of the pessimism from the intelligence literature, which, to be fair, is is quite well founded in their case. But I think it sort of shows the difference between trying to manipulate a cognitive construct that we're trying to view from the top down and trying to build up basic simple matching behaviors from the bottom that we know do exist in in several species to something that looks like complex cognition. And I think taking that bottom-up approach, which is what behaviorists do, lends itself to training very well in a way that I don't know that people from the intelligence community or the education community would have gotten to quite so well. And so while we agree with them that relational reasoning is important, When it comes to behavior change, everybody is a tacit behaviorist. They will use reinforcement. Cognitive behavioral therapies use chaining and they use exposure, things like that. You know, not many people will like me saying everyone's a tacit behaviorist when it comes to behavior change. But I personally believe that that's more or less true. (laughs) So I, I think behavioral science is something to offer in that sense. You know, taking the purely cognitive approach it's tremendously good for predicting 
performance and for sometimes explaining things but it just doesn't lend itself quite as well to behavior change as far as i can tell uh, with some exceptions of course gosh i got so many questions <laughs> i go on no no fantastic don't apologize for it i'll put a link to the smart training page in sure. show notes can anyone sign up and have a go or do you need to be um... anyone could sign up you can make private accounts or if you've got an organization or a school you can try to get a, a, a school slash organizational account i should mm. point out that i've no financial interest in this it's more just that i've been someone independently testing it which again credit to brian and sarah for having it independently tested i think it's it's worth a try if we're only half right the outcomes that we found are important enough that it would be in my opinion worth the money even if there's limited transfer to other tasks from a scientific point of view but yeah if you go to the smart training website i think it's it's worth a punt for sure even if we haven't finished doing all of the studies yet it, it's certainly in my estimation the most promising intervention for raising general cognitive ability that there is at the moment and i've mm. read a lot <laughs> What would I as a user see if I'd logged on? Is it possible to explain what my first level would be? What would I be doing typically? Sure. Well, I mean, you get a dashboard and you'll start with this initial assessment where you'll get 55 stages. It's called the Relational Abilities Index, which is just the first 55 stages of smart training to see how you do without training. You know, you'll put in your age and stuff like that so they can consider, well, how are you scoring relative to other people your age, which is essentially what IQ is. It's just how many cognitive tasks can you answer correctly compared to people your age. That's all it is. Once you do that, you'll go through this 55 stage test. It's relatively quick. You have a maximum of, I think, 30 seconds for each question. But you, you know, normally people answer it in 10, 20, depending on if you're someone who's tremendously conscientious, maybe. The first stage, once you get past that, it's just a simple relating task. It'll have two nonsense words. So let's say we call them job and walk, where they'll say job is the same as walk. And the question that you'll have to answer will be, is job the same as work? Yes or no? Got you. Simple as that. And then slightly more complex would be job is the same as walk. Is walk the same as job? Which is the reverse. And then the answer will be yes or no. And of course, yes or no are kind of counterbalanced. They're, they appear in different positions. So it's not just you click on one side, you get all the answers. You get tested, first of all, which is when they don't tell you whether you've got the right answer or not. And if you get 16 questions in a row correct, you can move on to the next stage. But if you don't, you do training, which is just when they tell you whether you've gotten the correct answer or not. The idea is that you figure out how do you respond to this word same in the middle? What is the pattern? But then you can add in more relations. So if job is the same as walk and walk is the same as kef, is kef the same as job? It becomes this sort of syllogistic reasoning game. But it's more than just syllogisms because you've other kinds of relations like more than and less than. So if A is more than B, then B isn't more than A. So that's harder. So it sort of scales up the complexity really, really gradually. And I think that's a really useful way of getting people to deal with just little bits of complexity at a time. And the, the good part is with every trial that you do, every question, I guess, the nonsense syllables that you're using are completely new. You'll never have seen them before. So what you're really learning is how do you respond to this relational cue? It's nothing to do with the stimuli themselves. It's how do you relate things, basically. That's how we get the far transfer part. It's because you mm. can apply it to all kinds of stimuli. Thank you so much for, for taking us on that little journey. I'm kind of itching to go and log on to it now and have a go. And give it a go. See what you think. I, I quite like it. I'd, I'd love to do it, but having tested myself before and after for something like IQ, I'd be really nervous about it. <laughs> I'd have all kinds of tests anxiety, but I, I, I've done it already. But I guess a top up couldn't hurt. But I, I wish that I had tested myself before and after just to see. Maybe a, a perfect lockdown activity. Maybe so. Maybe so. Absolutely. And I don't know whether this is a, a fair question to ask, but I'm going to ask it and see what you think. Sure. Potential implications for the world of work? For the world of work? If you were to pick one predictor to 
predict somebody's job performance, it's IQ by quite a way, especially in complex jobs. So jobs that aren't, you know, assigned by other people and repetitive, dynamic jobs that require concentration, innovation, attention, jobs that require you to do most of your job with your brain rather than your hands, let's say. And that's not to denigrate any jobs with hands, you know. It, it just means that there are different things required, basically. I would love to do a smart study in an organization where we tried to look at indices of productivity and perhaps of coping with complexity or well-being in some sense, and to see whether getting people to finish smart training helped them to cope with complexity. However, you were measuring that is another question, but maybe productivity even. So if you want to look at things like job ratings or what would you say productivity at work then the single best predictor is cognitive ability so maybe you could make your business more productive maybe more innovative i don't know that we haven't tested it yet but this would be a really good candidate and there's no better predictor than cognitive ability so this would be a great area to target if there was something promising and i think there is this is a study that, in my opinion, needs to be done. And if anybody wants to do it, please get in touch. That would be like my dream study. <laughs> so let's put that shout out there to the P-Supers. And, and it strikes me that I work with various different organizations, including NHS. Wow. And just the complexity of the organization is one thing. Yeah, I, It's just mapping that complexity of the relationships between different units or directorates and the knock-on effects of an activity in one place and the yeah. connections it can be quite terrifying to look at that and maybe furnishing ourselves with enhanced skills to impact on our understanding or our ability to operate in those environments is something that's absolutely you... and then of course you have to manage the needs of people who already have complex needs your, your patients and clients and then you've got obviously different regulations for different fields and different professions. You've got data management. You've got, I don't know, you've got underfunding. So you need to try to be as productive as possible with the resources that you have. And, you know, cognitive resources are one of those resources for people working in places like the NHS or even in small businesses, uh, maybe even big businesses that are having a hard time. Material resources are tremendously important, obviously. But yeah, your, your ability to cope with things cognitively, but also emotionally, it's tremendously important. As you said, I completely agree with you. If you could slightly bump up people's ability to deal with complexity and challenge, then that would be a good thing. Sometimes we can't get rid of the complexity or the challenge or the emotional difficulty. But if we could help people to deal with it better, given that it's inevitable, that would be great. If you, if you wouldn't mind, I'd like to plug a research study that we're working on that I think is related. We've got this sort of coaching package. We've got one that's essentially an ultra brief act-based package. It takes about an hour compared to a CBT, compared to psychoeducation. And one of the things that we wanted to test was whether these different therapies, I'm going to call them, even though psychoeducation is probably not a therapy and it's a coaching intervention rather than a therapy. We wanted to see whether they'd help people to cope with social ostracism. And this is obviously relevant at work where you've got interpersonal relationships to manage and that's really complex. In this case, we were looking at students because it's convenient, but also because there are a lot of students who are queuing up for mental health services and they're on long waiting lists and maybe something like a coaching intervention that could be delivered by somebody who's not a clinical psychologist, it would make the intervention more scalable, reach more people, help more people. We measured them on a bunch of things. We gave them the brief intervention. Then we got some baseline measures of physiological arousal to essentially have a physiological measure of whether people were distressed. And then we gave them a, a social ostracism task and we saw in all of the three conditions, people became physically more distressed or what seemed to us to be more distressed by their physiological responses. But afterwards, it was really only the people in the ACT condition that were willing to stay socially engaged. So it, my take home from this is we can't 
make things like social ostracism or complexity or whatever outside force it might be go away but it would be good to help people to deal with it now i don't say deal with it in an overly stoic sense in the sense that you know you just have to put up and shut up kind of thing but to deal with it in the sense that they feel less distressed which would be good <laughs> mm. or or even if they do feel stressed that they can at least move on and they can push forward and do things that are important with their day. That was something that I was quite happy to be involved in with the Chester Centre for Contextual Behavioural Science. And is that going to be published? Well, I've got permission to mention it because it's been presented at a conference, but it's going under review today-ish. But we have the data in it. We, we think it's a good design, so hopefully it'll be published. That sounds like a really tremendously interesting experimental design there. I love it. I thought it was interesting. It wasn't my idea. I, I, I have to give credit to the other guys, particularly uh, Kevin O'Shard and Lee Hulbert Williams. And there's another person, Sam Ashcroft, on that, who's doing some interesting work on RFT. And yeah, that was their idea. I came in at a later stage and, you know, I did some analyses and some writing. I think it was a really nice study. What I really like about it is the fact that it can be delivered by people who aren't clinical psychologists. So Imagine you had HR professionals doing it, or you had people working in student services who maybe their background isn't psychology, or maybe it's social care, something like that, where you wouldn't give therapy proper, so to speak. You wouldn't deliver cognitive behavioral therapy, for example, but maybe you could deliver a brief package based on it that could help people to deal with some of the things that they encounter in their environment, and it would just enable them to keep moving forward with what's important to them. And find meaning yeah this is something on my mind of the last year or so has been how can we reach more people with stuff that could be useful that's what we're really aiming for now especially with everything being locked down we're especially in interested in scalable interventions I, I mentioned at one point that we had the value clarification exercise for people who are high in negative effect i'm almost finished putting that online so hopefully that can reach more people and we can get some data on whether it works. Our first study on that was to test whether it's harmful. Because obviously, if you're getting people to think about that kind of thing, you want to make sure that you're at least not hurting people. And after that, then you can test it slightly more robustly and see whether it can actually help people as well as other value clarification exercises. It's basically a, in a card sort task format. It, it looks different, but it's the same principle, I think. So I'm looking forward to putting that out there and seeing if practitioners and maybe even researchers would like to use it and see if it's useful for certain people, especially people who have negativity biases and that kind of thing, and people who have difficulty projecting themselves into the future. Because I think that essentially what that means to me is that people who need therapies like ACT most are prevented from engaging with it because if you have a negativity bias and you can't project yourself into the future and impaired problem solving, that's another thing that we see in populations like that. Well, then actually setting higher order values might not just be intimidating, it might be just cognitively not possible. So it's about improving accessibility and giving people tools to help the people who need it most, really. Or that's what we hope, but we have to test it properly. Shane, I just wanted to pause and ask you a question I ask quite a lot of my guests is, is what song would you like to announce your arrival in a room for the next few months? This isn't for the rest of your life. What song would be one you choose or has significance for you? Sure. Well, I'm a big country music fan, so it's going to have to come from there. And I'm going to pick, I think, Card Carrying Fool by Randy Travis. If, if you listen to that one and, and you listen to the lyrics... It sort of describes my relationship with academia. It, it, it makes me think about the ups and downs and the, oh God, what am I doing this for? But it's just what I do. <laughs> and P-Supers will be glad to hear that I can't sing it because I'm not familiar with this song. It's a shame we've covered so much in our discussion. Is there a, a, a takeaway of sorts? Well, I guess an important takeaway point for me is... I think a lot of people will differ in terms of their opinion about how to help people, but most people will agree that we want to help people. I guess from my point of view, we, we have to make sure to test out our interventions properly and being open to being wrong as much as possible and be skeptical of our own areas. And that's how we can improve. If you wouldn't 
give an untested pill to vulnerable people. Don't give untested interventions to them either for things like mental health or whatever it is. We need to make sure that what we have works. And I believe that that's the best way to help people if we're self-critical and always looking to improve. Thank you. I think that scales out to everything from an organisational perspective. Be aware of the context around you. Be prepared to test and get feedback. Sure, absolutely. I'm always really sceptical when I see somebody come out with something that they're selling that has a brand new catchy acronym. I'm always sceptical of that and they're almost never properly tested. So yeah, try to get those clinical trials done if you can. (laughs) This is a little bugbear of mine. And here, P-Supers, is where my mic went a bit daft. What I went on to say was that I'm going to try and build on Shane's takeaway and say that if you're commissioning training or learning or workshops from a company, look beyond their flash marketing and ask them where the evidence is for what they're offering and has it been tested in an organisational setting. I really want organisations to consider how effectively they're investing their money. Right, get a second opinion. Just make sure that people who don't have a financial interest also agree that it's a good thing. Shane, I'm conscious of how much time I've taken from you. That's okay. You are absolutely fascinating to listen to. It's been a privilege to have you on the show and it's been really thought provoking. I've been really humbled by the way you describe things, but also the interest I've got in things like smart and the potential impact of that is phenomenal. Thank you so much for your time and for for sharing with me and the the P Supers. Well, thanks for having me and um sorry that sometimes I go on a little bit, but hopefully you can cut it in such a way that it's not too bad. (laughs) (laughs) Don't be daft. Listen, thank you so much again and enjoy your weekend. Maybe some bread making is in store. Yeah, bread eating probably. (laughs) (laughs) Cheers now. Thanks, Ross. Now then, pea supers, that's it in the bag. I'd like to thank Shane for joining me and for being so open and honest. I'm really excited to see where his research takes him next. And I, for one, am delighted that he is an academic and researcher pursuing work that has enormous potential. He described his relationship with academia as being a card-carrying fool. And long may he continue, I say, as the lyrics go to the song. But when it comes down to it, all I want to do is be your registered, certified, card-carrying fool. If you like this episode of the podcast, could I invite you to share it with one other person? I'm really keen to spread the behavioural science and skills with more people. Of course, a subscription, rating or review are also very much appreciated. Some of you may have seen that I've had some lovely people soup bookmarks printed. If you'd like a couple, just send me your postal address wherever you are in the world and I'll pop a couple in the post for you. They'll help you keep your place in all those books you're reading. The show notes are at rossmackintosh.co.uk and that includes links to a few different platforms. I blum and love to hear from you and you can get in touch at peoplesoup.pod at gmail.com. On Twitter, we are at peoplesouppod. On Instagram, we are at people.soup. And on Facebook, we are at peoplesouppod. Thanks to Andy Glenn for his spoon magic and to you for listening. Look after yourselves, peace supers, and bye for now. Well, hopefully it's not too bad. Oh, I'm really excited. I'm nervous.